Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Very happy to be here. So I'm going to talk about synthesis from temporal specifications. Uh, this is um, the main part of this is joint work with Amir Pinoeli and Yaniv Saar. But there are other things that I, I did with other people in loan that sort of are related. And you'll see. So to start, I want to give some, some general background. And let's start with what is verification and why do I like it? <laughs> so um, what is the normal process of development? Uh, first, we have to decide what the system that we want to make does. You know, preferably, we write it informally. And then we go on designing and implementing things. And then we test it. Um, we prefer to push the testing as high up as possible, start testing as early as possible. And from my point of view, we want to uh, combine in the testing the normal, the normal kind of testing that running the program for many different inputs and just following and seeing what happens with formal verification where we actually write what we want the system to do and we check formally that it does what we expected it. And um, basically the, test, the testing phase makes sure that the first two bullets match each other, that the system indeed does what we wanted it to do. Now, unfortunately or fortunately, um, the systems that we work on are very, very uh, complicated. And sometimes people make bugs. And yeah, I, I know this comes as a great surprise to the crowd. <laughs> but <laughs> and so I, I very much like this Mars rover, first because it's cute. And then because it didn't explode or anything, but it was fixed and it continues working and it sends very nice pictures of Mars, of stones in Mars, and such things. But anyway, the point here is that at some point in January 2004, it just had too, too many open files in memory. The program couldn't handle that and the machine just froze, couldn't react to anything, and it took a few days to just fix it remotely. But essentially, that was a bug and could have been worse. So these kinds of systems, they, they're, the main complexity in these kinds of systems is not in the computing very complex things. They, they're not doing very complex computations, but they actually have to react to their environment. This is why they're called uh, reactive systems. These are things like operating systems, um, or um, file handlers, or uh, file handlers, drivers, CPUs. And the main complexity is in you have some environment or some user or some other program and you have to interact with it. You have to keep on maintaining communication, keep on uh, receiving inputs and reacting to them. And like the, the file system on this Mars rover, there is, when you handle a file, when you give some information, this transaction ends. But the file system has to just stay there. It has to be continually, uh, continuously enabled, continuously uh, be able to answer more and more queries. So there's no point in time where you say, this is done, I'm, I'm finished my job, I can terminate and go to sleep. So the system just stays there essentially forever in the case of this uh, Mars, Mars robot um, till today. And if we want to reason formally about whether the system behaves correctly or not, we first have to say what is behavior. And here I'm taking the linear approach to what is a behavior. Behavior is the sequence of states that the system passes along a computation. And if the system is non-deterministic while we're working on it and we're abstracting it, or if it has many possible inputs, then it would have many possible behaviors. And again, for the type of reactive systems that we're working on, every behavior is infinite. Uh, 
And our goal is to verify the system. So we formally write what we expect the system to do. We do that using temporal logic and we use automata as an intermediate tool to reason about logic and to compare it versus the problem. Now we have this effort that goes about writing the specification. We have to formalize what we want from the system in order to actually check it later on. And this raises another question. We have this formal specification that someone writes and the question that rises is why can't we just use that in order to automatically produce something? In normal development what we do is we think what we want the system to do and we write how we want the system to do it. If we just give the what, can't we produce the how automatically? And this will produce systems that are ensured to work correctly according to what we wrote. And what I have in mind is something as follows. We have a system. It has some environment that it's interacting with. And it gets some input. Now it reads this input and it reacts. It gives some output that's a function of this input. It gets another input, it has some memory of both inputs, and it produces an output that has to do with these two inputs. It gets another input and it produces a function of the three, all the past that it's seen so far, and so on and so on. And essentially what we want when we say a system or a program is that we want a function from sequences of inputs to outputs. And what we want is that regardless of what are the actual inputs, we want this sequence, this interaction that occurs between the environment and the system to satisfy some behavior. So we have here a linear behavior that's the, the result of this interaction, and we want this to satisfy the specification. Now the history of this problem goes a long way back. It was first posed by Alonzo Church in 1963, and then it was solved about uh, six years later by, independently by Rabin and Buki and Landweber. Rabin uses uh, the theory of automata infinite trees to give a solution. Buki and Landweber propose a uh, reduction to infinite duration gains. Now we know that these two uh, solutions are basically two sides of the same coin and they're doing more or less the same thing. What they were using at the time was uh, monadic second order logic, first order, second order logic of one success, or second of the logic of words as the specification language. And then Penuelli and Rosner in uh, 89 adapted these to modern specification formalisms. They write the specification in LTL. And they basically use Rabin's, uh, Rabin's ideas to run, to, to represent programs as trees. And they use uh, word and trees automata to check the specification. Let's try to look a bit deeper on how they use tree automata to do that. We said that the program is a function from sequences. We said that the program is a function from sequences of inputs to outputs. And this can be embedded into a tree. And how we do that? Essentially, every path on the tree is uh, some sequence of inputs. And if we put on the nodes the actions that we expect the system to do, this is exactly what we get. Every node is a sum sequence of inputs, and this is what I expect the system to do when it reads this sequence of inputs. So we know how to put the program on a tree, and what do we have to do now? Now we have to check that the program does ex indeed what we expected it to do. We want to go over Oh, do you see that? No. No, I'll just. So now in order to check this thing, that, so we embedded the program into a tree. And now we want to check this. So we want to basically go over each one of the paths and make sure that the resulting interaction between the system and the environment satisfies the specification that we have in mind, that this is a good behavior of the system. For that, what we want to do is we, have, we want to build some kind of tree automaton that will check all paths simultaneously and make sure that this is a good program. 
Once we have such a tree automaton that accepts good programs, we want to actually ask, is this automaton empty? Does there exist some program that this automaton accept? And if we can get our hands on such a program, then we turn it into uh, the program that we are after. No, this is given a specification. Okay. This is how we we want to produce it. Right. And there's a there's a catch here. When we want to check that every path in the program satisfies our specification, we are going from talking about linear behaviors. We are talking about behaviors that have to do with one path in the tree. And now we're checking a global property of the entire tree, and we want to check it simultaneously by going on over all the paths. And we have to go somehow go from reasoning about single paths to reasoning about trees, to, to talk about the full structure. And for that, we can't use non-deterministic word automata. There's a problem here. So here I have an automaton that says that the output stabilizes at zero. The machine here starts to read, uh, it starts to read an input here. It reads some zeros and ones. And then eventually it goes here where it sees only zeros. And it has to stabilize at zero and stay there. This is a very simple path property. But if we want to say that on a tree, then we can't use this machine. And let's see why. We have a tree here. And every path here stabilizes at zero. If we go. If we go at some point to the right, we see a 1, then below it there are only zeros. If we just stay on the leftmost branch, then we just see zeros. But this machine, the... These are just the outputs. I don't care at the moment about the, uh, the input. Okay. I'm just giving an example. I'm showing why this is too weak to be used in this context. I have to do something else. Our inputs, and this is just the names of the states. So I'm going to try to run this on the tree. Sort of, I have a word automaton, but I'm going to try to run it on the tree and say that this tree is good. This is what I want. I want a, I want a tree where the output stabilizes at zero. I want to check that. There, yeah. The thing on the left, the zero is the one that the yes. Yes. And so, so let's just try to do that. We start with the initial state Q0. And now we see that there are still ones below us. So we can't immediately go to the, to, to, to the first state, to, to state Q1. We have to continue staying in Q0. If we look on the, on the subtree on the, on the right, then it sees a 1. So it can't go to Q1 again. It stays in Q0. But now everything is safe. It just sees zeros. So it can continue and accept with Q1s. We need to move to the next node. Here again, there is one below it. So it can't just go to the, to the, to the state Q1. It has to continue with Q, Q0. When it branches to the right, it reads the one. And then it continues, and it, this is safe. The problem is with this leftmost branch. Wherever you are on the leftmost branch, there is always some one below you. And there is no point in, the, in, this, in this tree where you can say, OK, I'm safe. I can go to the state Q1. So what do we have here? We have here some tree that represents you know, possible outputs. And we want to check that these outputs satisfy some requirement. We have a machine that checks this requirement on paths. And we're trying to expand it to a machine that does that on trees. And we can't do that with a non-deterministic automaton. For that, we have to use a deterministic automaton. What we saw there is that we have a non-deterministic machine. And it has to guess where there will be no more inputs, when, when there will be no more ones. right? Here, at some point, you had to guess 
you had to see a zero and you know, take the jump, pass here. And you sort of guess no more ones will be below us. But there was no point when reading this, this path, this leftmost branch, there was no point where this guess could have been taken. When we take a non-deterministic machine and have to run it on a tree, every guess that we make has to, to, to match all the paths that are below the guess points. And as we saw, this may be impossible. So what we have to do is we have to go to deterministic machines. And Pnueli and Rosner were lucky to be working uh, at Weizmann exactly at the time that Safra produced his determinization result. This is determinization for automata on infinite words. This is a bit different from determinization for automata on finite words. And they use this determinization as a subroutine. They say exactly what, uh, what we said earlier, but with a deterministic automaton. We have a word property. We have a deterministic automaton for this word property. And we'll just run this deterministic automaton all over the tree at the same time, and this would work fine. So they were using Safra's determinization. But unfortunately, Safra's determinization is extremely complex. It is a bit similar to the determinization that we know for automata on finite words. But instead of just following one set of states, it has to partition this set of states and follow it in the form of a tree. These trees satisfy some set of invariants. Right? Every state of the deterministic automaton is a tree that has some labels around it, and it satisfies some invariants. If you want to make a transition in the deterministic automaton, you destroy the structure of the tree, you get out of the invariants, and then you just fix it to, and to, to satisfy the invariants again. The acceptance condition, this is what we, have to, um, what we have to supply in order to make the run accepting. I'm not going to go into that. But essentially, the construction is too complicated. Uh, Safra published his result in 1988. It took about 17 years to implement seriously for the first time. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, no. Yes, but so what is a non deterministic program? So actually, the strategies that, that we produce are non deterministic, but uh, we are usually, usually forced to, to, to work harder and to produce deterministic uh, decisions. So um, maybe we should delay this to, to a later stage. But essentially, what we get from this procedure eventually is something that is not restricted enough. You know, there are many possible programs that do what you want. And this leads to, to actually to a non-deterministic program. And then we have to work further in order to determinize it because this is what we actually need. We don't know how to produce non-determinism. But the, de the determinization here is a tool that helps us check that the program is correct. But it, it doesn't mean that the result is deterministic. But I, I think that the main point of this part of the talk is to say that we don't want determinization. Determinization is too, complex, too complicated. Um, Safra's determinization looks uh, something like this. You have, you, know, you, you, have, you have trees where every node is labeled, every edge is labeled. Uh, nodes here have, have multiple labels and they have colors in, in addition. And then in order to make a transition, what you have to do is to, you know, you, you do a sequence of, of, of changes. And here, there are some invariants on the structure of the tree. Here, these are invariants are ruined, and these sequence of transitions reinstate these invariants until you get again. Uh, it's, it's just too complicated. And essentially, when people try to implement it, it doesn't work well. First, it took about 17 years to get a reasonable implementation. And then, you know, this, 
This is what the implementation does after six states, and the reason that there is no seventh line in the table is that because you just exploded. So it, it, this, this approach just doesn't work. Yes, but the no, that, that's the same question. But in order to be able, so the distinction between inputs and outputs I solved by putting on, on by putting it on a tree. So once I put the sorry, but I'm using the board. <laughs> sorry, no, okay. So essentially, what we want is 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 sequence of inputs to outputs. So for every sequence of inputs, we have to produce one output. And the way to handle this different sequences of inputs is by putting it on a tree. And now, and now every possible input corresponds to a different place. And if we write here some action, then this would be the action that corresponds to, I have seen this sequence of, out, of inputs. And now, so this is our plan. The plan is the tree has a fixed structure. These are all the inputs that I'm, I'm going to, I, I'll have to handle. They're, you know, they, they're infinite, they are arbitrarily long and the tree goes infinitely down, but, and infinitely wide, and infinitely wide yes. And, sorry? It's a big tree. It's a big tree, yes. But essentially, every point here has just sort of one action. What's the result? So this is a program. This is any, any program. And now we have to ask ourselves, okay, I, I want to check this, that I want to somehow find such programs. And one question is, this, this F, what, does, what realizes this F? Is this some program with finite memory? Is this some... Uh, a program that handles a pushdown? Is this Turing strong? Is it not Turing strong? And essentially in, in this talk, this has to do about, you know, I want to produce the weakest possible machine that can do what you want. So now the question reduces to what do you want, what do you actually want written on, on each of these paths? So your specification just talks about paths. You talk about each path separately. And now, essentially what you want is to somehow say, I have a machine that can tell me whether one sequence is right. This is something that I know how to do. I want to, I, I, if you give me just one sequence, I know how to say this is good, this is bad. I want, I want to know, I want to say, you know, this transition here is, is, is something that I disallow. I know how to say that you know, it's, there, is some, there is some request that was raised here and it was never answered in the future. No, but if you, if you just go over a path in the tree, okay. you get this interactions phase by phase. You get Input, output, input, output, input, output. And you sort of build the computation. And, and now what you want to say is that you embedded this in the tree. You have a property for each of the paths. But you have to somehow check that simultaneously. You have to somehow say there is something that is global for this tree that makes this program that's written on this tree correct. And the way to do that is to go to, to just run a deterministic word automaton on every one of these on every one of these paths simultaneously. If the automaton is deterministic, it doesn't make any guesses, and you can run it simultaneously in all directions. The only problem is that it doesn't work practically. <laughs> because determinization is unfortunately too complex. 
So this is a point where we have to stop and think about what we actually want to do. People develop this very, very nice theory, but it doesn't work in practice. And let's stop for a minute and think, look, look, what is it really that we have to handle? What are specifications, what do specifications actually look like? So first, usually we have assumptions and we have guarantees. These are two separate things. One is that actually I'm not just I'm not going to handle every possible set of, uh, of inputs. Some inputs, I, I don't expect my environment to do that. I don't expect my environment to, to behave completely arbitrarily. I have some assumptions about my environment, and this is, what I wanna, this is where I want to work. So these are our assumptions. And given that these assumptions actually work, this is what I guarantee. So my specification is sort of partitioned to the environment and what I promise. And this is a very important distinction. Second, each one of these are usually huge conjunctions of very small things. I want to say that this particular, so the input is just you know, a lot of variables, and I want to say that this variable is, is related not to the entire structure, but it just reads a few things and relates to them. So essentially the these assumptions and guarantees are partitioned into very, a lot of very, very small things. Properties are, there, there is, we can say a lot of things, but essentially a lot of times properties resemble each other. This led to uh, suggesting something called property libraries. You have these kinds of templates and you just plug in some parts and each time you plug in something slightly different and you get I want this behavior to relate to this and those parts of the environment and this, this, and this part of the, uh, of the system. And, but essentially, this means that they're very, very similar, and we just instantiate them many, many times. And the overwhelming majority of the properties that we get are safety. They mean something bad never happens. And we have to take advantage of this thing. And this goes, we're not the first to do that. This goes back to Ramaj and Wonham in 189. And they said, all we care about is invariance. We just care that you know, I don't do anything immediate that breaks anything. And this they can solve in linear time. Then Asarin, Mahler, Pnueli, and Sifakis in 95 talk about invariance and recurrence. I want to be able to say also some things happen often. And they can solve that in quadratic time. And then in our work, in uh, this is joint work with Pnueli and Saar, we specify a subset that is called generalized reactivity one. I'll, I'll give details in, in a second. And it's also, we can, we can produce an automaton that, does, that checks that in quadratic time. The entire check takes quadratic time. So what is it that we consider? First, the variables are partitioned. We have inputs and we have outputs. Then part of the specification, I'm, I'll only point to the lower part because this word. Maybe I could bet by them. So we have parts that talk about the inputs, and this means, you know, I expect this, the environment to start more or less here, and we can talk about the, in, the initial state of the system, but then it already sees the first input. So I can restrict the first output according to the first input. And now I, I only care about immediate safety. I want, I want the environment given the current input and the current output to guarantee some kind of safety, but immediately. In the next step, these are the kinds of inputs that I expect to see. And similarly for the system, except again that it has this edge. It sees the input and then it can adjust the output. And we have these additional things that talk about liveness 
and they're just a conjunction of recurrence properties. We want these good things to happen infinitely often. And again, these good things are very, very local. Yes. So uh, I'll get. Yes. So, but could, will, will you allow me to continue a bit, and then I get to the example. So the box says it is always the case that this happens. So I, wanna, we, we, I want every pair of these to satisfy what's written in the R there. This, this is basically the box. Says. The I part just says I care about this one, and I restrict what's written around here. The box R says I'm, I care about every one of these pairs. Now, every one of these pairs should do, should uh, satisfy some requirements. And the last thing says, I want you know, these things to occur often. I want, you know, if I, if I have some request that is not answered immediately, I don't want it to just hang in there. I want it to be answered. So I, I can't leave it just dangling. And the main thing is that we handle every part that, that we saw here separately. The initial and the transition parts are already given to us as symbolic constraints. The user wrote them as symbolic constraints. And what we do is we just take them and just add them to the automaton as it is. And let's... So we have the initial requirements, we have the transition requirements, and let's see a very simple example. We have some kind of arbiter. It reads two request lines, and it controls two grant lines. Okay? There are some clients that send requests, and we, have, we are working on the arbiter that just controls the grants. If I want to, so now I have the grants written here, and the requests are written sort of on the edges. And I even chose the right color. No, I, sorry? Yeah. And this is supposed to be some kind of tree automaton that would sort of, it would read trees that have uh, grants and requests, and it will tell us that these are correct in a way. Now here, I, I just assume that you know, one variable changes at a time, because otherwise you can make any sense out of it, and you probably can't make any sense out of it, and, or you know, this. But essentially it says, you know, there are, there are environment changes that change one of the requests, and there are system changes that change uh, one, of the, one of the grants. Here, grant one is given. And essentially, I didn't restrict anything, so every one of the arrows is bidirectional. I don't know where I start. And so, essentially, the root here can say anything, and I, you know, any possible transition is fine. But now I, I, I start restricting it with these parts that I I distinguished in the specification. So first we have just one initial state. So suddenly what's written here is very, very restrictive. Now we have to wait for grants. If I request something, I wait for it. I don't just withdraw my grants. So all these arrows up there and all the arrows down here become unidirectional. You, t you can't just, you know, when, when you stand here on the tree and you raise some request, 
the next input can't be an input that, raise, that removes that request immediately. You wait for, for it to be granted. Sorry? For one process? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? Yes, but not on this example. <laughs> Um, another thing that I want to say, I want to say I don't, I don't want to grieve a grant without them being requested. So here I restrict these arrows to be unidirectional again. So the structure, when I add these requirements, the structure is becoming more and more simple. We, we're, we don't allow to, you know, if someone is using my grant, I don't withdraw it. So all these arrows that go up, they also become unidirectional. And now, I don't want to give two grants at the same time. So I'll just put it in the structure. Whenever one grant is given, I just won't give another one. And then suddenly all this part of the automaton just disappears. So I use... Um, yeah, so all these are, are these parts. You know, I used these parts of the specification. And I just embedded them into the structure as they are. And if I handle, uh, and, I, and I do, I want to handle everything symbolically with, in this case, BDDs, then these parts are just taken as they were written by the user and they're plugged in into the automaton without paying any price. And what's left is just adding these liveness things. And the next part that... The next part that... we do in that paper is to actually say how to handle these extra requirements. I don't, this is just, this is the, the length of the code. This is all that you should get from this, um, from this algorithm. But essentially what it says is that everything is handled symbolically. We give a symbolic algorithm that computes the evidence to the existence of such programs. This is a very short symbolic uh, program. And then we get our answer. If this, ans if this program uh, returns something that is full, that has some states in it, then we know that the answer is yes. If it returns an empty set, then the answer is no. And from, from the actual computation of this thing, we also can um, produce the program that we are after. We, can, we, we get an actual witness, an, an actual tree that we build from it, the program. Yes. Um, this is, it's called, um, Actually, it's not exactly the programming language because I, I made it shorter. Every one of, every one of, this is, this is written in TLV. It's some uh, symbolic programming environment. And I replaced all these, these parts where it says greatest fixed point and, no, I, I didn't replace, no, it was added to the, to the <laughs> it was recently added to the, um, essentially I did, but then it was added to the, And for the example of the arbiter that we just saw, we actually produce the strategy for up to 90, um, 90 clients. This is a very, very simple um, specification. This is the part up there is what the specification looks like, and this is the behavior. But 
the main claim against this work is that what you can say is very, very restricted. You're allowed just to say, you know, you, you're allowed to relate adjacent nodes, the initial states, and you can just say you know, things about specific nodes that happen a lot. And, but if you want to say, if you want to say things that are more general, all you have to do is to go back to the deterministic machines. You have to add them sort of on the side. And I don't have time to go into how to do that exactly. But the difference is that instead of having this mega specification that is huge and that you can't handle, what you get is that is now a collection of a collection of very, very small things. And now each one of these may require something relatively small that is needed in order to somehow increase your tree automata. So each one of these adds some deterministic part to, the, to your automaton that is relatively small. And when you handle them together, things hopefully stay uh, more or less reasonable. And by more or less reasonable, this is more or less what I mean. This is joint work with Blom, Geller, Jobstman, Pnueli, and Wallinghofer. And what we took here is, uh, this is a, an industrial standard. This is some um, standard that's available for people to buy. For universities, it's for free. It's, uh, the company's named ARM, and it's called AMBA AHB bus. It's a bus that's supposed to handle uh, up to 15 masters and 15 clients. And the part that we were interested in is the arbiter, again. It handles data, it handles addresses of the clients. Uh, the arbiter does most of the control, and this is why we were interested in the arbiter. And uh, what we did is basically write the specification in PSL. This is a, um, an extension of linear temporal logic that was recently suggested as a, um, as a standard for hardware. I don't want you to read these, but this is more or less the size of the specification. And the main thing here is that parts of these are, are you know, each one of these is exactly one of these requirements. And for some of them, we just have to add this small machine that would do something deterministically. It would add some, some kind of memory that would follow a few things, and then we can talk about it in the simple way that we saw. but then I'm allowed to choose the simplest one, right? <laughs> Sorry, G3. Can you choose one that I can point to? <laughs> G3. G3 is too high. OK. So here, G6. Uh, it is always the case that if you don't start a transition, the, the next stage doesn't start a transition doesn't start a transmission. And you remember that you're allowed sort of, there's a, there's a, the system is allowed to know the next, uh, the next input. So this is the next input. You don't start a transition. But it, it's not, this is our way of reasoning about, about the, this part together. So we're saying it first sees the input and then reacts to it. So this is why we're talking about the next doesn't start a transmission. The, the master that's in control of the bus is some master. If, if you don't start a transition, then the master doesn't change. And if the master is locking the, um, the bus, then it is stays locked. Sorry? By transition, you mean the I don't understand. By transition, I mean? I mean you, you use the word transition. Transmission. Transmission. Transmission on the bus. If you send some information on the bus. Yes. 
Yes, one of those says, actually no, because, and, and let me tell you why. Because this is, um, this is built into the structure. By coding the, the, um, the master in binary, you don't have a choice. You can't, the master is always, there is always one. It's a binary number that points to one of the masters. Yeah. No. No, there are no 16. There are uh, four. In the, yep. I know. Uh. So. So again, I'm exposing weaknesses. And the main problem here is that these deterministic parts are, are produced manually. And uh, we are currently, well, you see that. So the problem is that still determinization is extremely complex. We are looking on ways how to improve it. And for example, uh, one for, let me skip that. One is improving Safra's determinization. Um, we know uh, after this, we, we started studying this determinization and we were able to improve it a bit. It's still not a very pleasant thing to, imp to, um, to implement, but at least it is nicer, it is easier to minimize, it is easier to reason about. And where this is joint work with Henzinger, we are also looking on ways how to <coughs> throw determinization aside, where we want to try something that would not require uh, determinization, and we know how to characterize non-deterministic automata that can be used in this context. And this would, would, this would allow simpler automata to be plugged in in this kind of things. Um, the next kind of things that need to be done is how to handle symmetries. A lot of these properties that we were talking about are, as I said, are templates that do more or less the same thing. We want to somehow reuse parts that handle separate things and reuse them. Um, Pre-compiled specification libraries. Um, if we have these properties, that these templates, and we can do a lot of work on a restricted number of things and produce something that's reasonable for these libraries, then essentially we don't care that other things are less efficient. Um, Currently, this is mainly considered in the context of hardware. How do we scale up to embedded software and protocols? Uh, the main problem here is that is with perform actual performance in practice. We we don't have uh, we don't have currently ways to say that we don't have ways to say this thing should happen fast. This thing is more important than other things. The, the, these are not parts of normal specification languages, and we just have to add them, and we have to learn how to specify for synthesis, and this is something that no one has done before. As a summary, we've taken the syntactic approach to synthesis. We extended it, and we know how to handle something that is tailored to the structure of specifications that we get in practice. We applied this to one, in two, actually two industrial examples, and both uh, we learned a lot from these um, test cases. Uh, we learned especially what we don't know. And for example, it's not written here, but one of the problems is how to continue. Um, we, we are getting this tree thing, and now we actually have to somehow produce code from that. This is something that very basic ideas were known about, and we have to do that. Um, you mentioned the, the, the issue of determinism. So 
what we get is something that contains many trees. <coughs> we get a lot of trees at the same time. So we, currently we, we have to extract one of them and how to do that. There are many possible directions to continue and thank you.